All right. It's a big gallery. I'm so Hi, ready. To you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm, you know, it's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. I see a lot still coming in. We already have over 50 here. Um, so it, it is really nice to see everyone start to pour in here. Um, this is the first UCross inter uninterrupted um, event, the first of our series. So I want to welcome you to that and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is William Belcher. I'm the incoming president of UCross. You, some of you may know me as the former director of development. So if you've seen me before, that I was wearing a different hat. <laughs> um, but I want to welcome you here tonight. Uninterrupted takes its name from our mission, of course. UCross's mission is to offer uninterrupted time and space to artists of all disciplines. It's also a signal, I think, that um, you know, our relationship with our alumni extends uninterrupted through, through time and throughout their career. This event and our virtual events, as well as our in-person events, give us a moment to um, cheer for our alumni, celebrate our alumni, and also celebrate their accomplishments and their role in the nation's arts and letters. So we are here to do that tonight with this uninterrupted event. Few housekeeping things to start as we get going. Um, first, you'll see I've, I've switched the gallery view here, but I was also or to speaker view. Um, I will just note that we are recording and we are also streaming. So um, that, two things. One, this video will be available then on Facebook tomorrow on our Facebook page, on our YouTube page, as well as on our, um, on our website, ucross.org. So you can feel free to share this video and share it with friends or share it on your social media tomorrow as well. Second, you, you can see that there is a little bit of a lag at times. And if you're experiencing a lag, you can always turn your video off. And sometimes that helps. I know we all have these sort of Zoom games we play as we try to get our way through all of this. But I think we're also might experience a little lag with, with Tina. So just bear with us if, if we have a little choppiness with, with Tina's video. <laughs> I'm not wrong. Um, third, and I think this is the most important one, I would say is leave your questions for Tina and Judith, any questions that come up in the chat. And if there's time at the end, we will be asking some of those questions to the presenters. Um, so we really would welcome any, any input and, and questions you may have for the two of them. So for introductions, I'm gonna start here with some introductions and I'll start with Judith. You see Judith back there. Um, Judith Freeman is a acclaimed novelist, uh, critic and essayist. MacArthur Park, um, which was released last October is her newest book. And I believe she'll talk about MacArthur Park in a, in a second. In the um, LA Review of Books, the writer and, um, writer and editor Tom Nolan referred to the novel as bracing and engrossing, tough and tender. I think that's a pretty good combination and a pretty good description. Um, Judith is also the author of the memoir, The Latter Days and the biography, The Long Embrace, Raymond Chandler and the Women He Loved. Judith and her husband, um, the award-winning photographer, Anthony Hernandez, who, who I did see back there before, were the uh, first couple actually to be in residence at UCross. So that's nice and we are very honored that they they both serve on our National Advisory Council. We're thrilled that Judith was kicking off this event here, this UCross Uninterrupted event with us tonight. Tina, so Tina, well, you know, you can see here on your screen, Judith will be in conversation with her longtime friend, Tina Barney. Tina is a renowned photographer who has illuminated the lives, the inner lives of her subjects for more than 40 years, often with large scale color images that, quote, straddle the line between candid, the candid and the choreographed. And that line I kind of stole from the, I think the flap copy of a beautiful uh, 240 page monograph that Rizzoli put out in 2017, which was titled, what else, uh, Tina Barney. So that is a really beautiful thing. You should look it up and, and uh, see if you can find that one of those copies as well. Her iconic photographs can be found in many public collections, including Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, LACMA, that's the Los Angeles County of Art Museum, sorry, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the um, MFA in Boston, 
and many, many other places. So we are thrilled to have Tina here as well. And we're looking forward to this conversation. So that is enough talking for me. I'm going to pass it to Judith, who I believe is going to talk a little bit about MacArthur Park and kick off this conversation. Good. Take it away, Judith. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much, Bill. And thank you to Caitlin Adelsberger for helping us so much with the images tonight. Um, and especially thank you for Tina for joining me. Um, I really wanna just start out by talking a little bit about MacArthur Park uh, very briefly, because I think it will weave in and out of our conversation tonight. One of the great themes of MacArthur Park is female friendship and also marriage. So marriage and friendship, um, the former um, details a couple, Verna and Vincent, who have been married for many years and now are facing a challenge in their lives. The friendship between Verna and Jolene goes way back to their childhoods um, in the small town in Utah where they grew up in very different circumstances. Verna was born in uh, a, a family of uh, eight children, uh, a devout Mormon family, um, and a kind of working class circumstances. Jolene, on the other hand, came from a very high wealth background. Her family were famous gun makers. And after they graduate from high school where they've been best friends, um, Jolene ends up going to Bryn Mawr and then goes on to become a very famous feminist performance artist. We're talking here about the 1970s and 80s when she first begins to gain recognition. Verna, on the other hand, gets married straight out of high school. And when her marriage fails, she reconnects briefly with Jolene, who's living in Los Angeles. Um, what also connects them is a relationship that becomes clear as the book goes on with the same man, um, Vincent. And uh, when Jolene comes back into Verna's life after a 30 year absence, Verna has become a writer against all odds. Jolene has become an internationally famous performance artist. And she comes back into Verna and Vincent's life and she asks a favor of Verna. She says, I want you to take me back um, to the town where we were born. And they set off on a long journey um, through the American West, a hundred and some pages of two women in a car, very old friends, childhood friends who've reconnected after all these years. And it's a one long conversation as they drive through the Great Basin, Nevada. So that landscape as with all of my books, I think uh, becomes almost like a character. It allows me to really talk about my deep love of the American West. So those are the main themes in MacArthur Park, uh, a marriage that is being challenged and a very old friendship between two women who've reconnected and are making this journey through the West. Because I met Tina in the West, in Idaho, almost 40 years ago, I'm gonna sort of pass it over to you now, Tina, so that you can talk about how we met and where we were at that point in our lives. Well, uh, that's wonderful to hear you talk about your book, Judith. Uh, it's complex. The I'm sorry about the internet. I just got a sign here saying it's unstable, but I'll keep talking. Um, it's complex. The narrative is complex, but it's so beautiful. And uh, I'm in awe of someone that can write something that I've never been able to do. But we met in Sun Valley in 1972, 73, New Yorker. We came there, I had family, two sons, and moved and left New York City in, uh, and came to Sun Valley just because I'd skied there and we thought it might be a fun place to live, not knowing there was an art center there. Uh, I'd started collecting photography before I got to Sun Valley. So uh, this was very early on in the sort of beginnings of photography. I knew who was my That's all. 
and uh, started off taking classes with Peter Delory. And right at that time, Judith Freeman walked into the art center I was at and we met and we actually met on the mountain, became friends and took a workshop that we have a photograph of here put up uh, with Jane Michaels. And uh, Caitlin, can we have that first photograph? Okay, great. Um, and that was kind of funny and fun because uh, Judith being a writer took that photography workshop right here, uh, this one right here. Um, there we are, me on the left, Judith on the right. This is 19, I think it's 1998. Uh, and this was the beginning of our friendship, the beginning of us both uh, being artists, doing what we wanted to do, but not really knowing what lay of us. So uh, kind of fun uh, to go back and um, sort of trace our friendship that has been a great deal uh, developed by telephone and by letters and now the internet and sort of uh, go back through our whole lives and, and see what good friends we've made, even though we live in different places. And so then we would like to tell you about how we've been doing this book that we'd like to do together. Uh, can we have the next slide, uh, Caitlin, please? So this is the 1970s. Uh, I think this is Sun Valley. Uh, I think um, our first workshop was at these hot springs. springs. I feel like people had their clothes and on in the 70s. This is the photograph I took in the hot springs. Uh, I get our cameras right in hot water there. And uh, I'm doing a book on, pictures, on photographs I took in the 70s that right before I, I didn't even think I was going to become a photographer. I was an amateur. I knew what really important photography was. And so this is when we became friends. Photograph came. Um, I went on to photography there. Oh, this is this is on that same day. And Judith photographed me and our friend Andy in those hot And so Judith took pictures. But uh, we really know, you know, what what our few be. And uh, we both stayed in Sun Valley. I stayed longer than Judith and went on our ways and, uh, you know, studied. Judith kept on writing. And I went back to New York and, and kept on making pictures. Can I have um, the next picture? If I could just say yes, more you that. It really was incredible that we met when we did. Um, through our love of skiing, our deep love of skiing. And when we took that photograph, uh, photography workshop together with Dwayne Michaels, I knew that I wanted to be a writer and Tina was discovering that she wanted to be a photographer, but we watched each other take up these pursuits, you might say at that point. And so for 40 years, we have watched each other evolve in the way our, our, our careers, our art and our writing has evolved. And the next couple of slides, photographs, um, Caitlin, you could put the first one up. We really wanted to show our origins because in, in many ways, our friendship was so unlikely. I don't know where else uh, Tina and I could have become friends except in this environment in a way of, of Sun Valley and through our, our passionate love of sports. So this is a picture of we, me with my family in Ogden, Utah. I grew up in a big Mormon family, a fourth generation Westerner, Mormon pioneers. And that's me with the, my hand over my face. Um, my mother will have one more child to add to this family. Um, I grew up surrounded by relatives in a very loving family, but in a very strong patriarchal religious culture. So now Tina's. Uh, the slide of Tina's childhood, which was taken when we were about the same age. So this is this, uh, what, uh, 1949, Judith, right? We think it's 1949. This is my family photographed by Vogue. This is uh, the East uh, Long Island, North Shore of Long Island. Uh, what I think is, is uh, amusing is the choreography of this photograph, very much uh, of what, I, what I've spent trying to do you know darn well the way I could have absorbed this and known what was going on at this time because I was so young and so I, for me it's really fun to see this uh, but again as said or we really came from dis different places 
And, I, and what I think is also fun, Judith, back is that I don't remember the thing about ritual. And uh, we went on those paths, the same path. Uh, and it, it was a while before we said, oh my gosh, we're really doing the same thing in very different, with very different we, subject matter. We really were. We were both very, very interested in family and in home and in relationships and in um, the distance that people maintain between each other or the ways in which they reveal each other. And this photograph of your family is so prescient in the sense that so many of your photographs will be trying to bring people together in some way or other to try and reduce that distance between people. And yet you were brought up in this world of such formality, some that didn't exist in my world. I remember you talking about when you were raised, children would always stand up when an adult came into the room. I mean, that was of course nothing that would ever happen in the West. So the difference between the formality in your background, the rituals and the kind of rituals in my background, which mostly revolved around religion and, and sort of an idea of Western history, you might say. So let's go to the next photograph. Um, sorry for interrupting Judith. And I just wanted to, to sort of interject this photograph taken in 1982. It was the first time that I, called called New York Times. And this is really the first time that I, after photographing since 1973, um, made a photograph that was had been in my dreams, that this was what I was looking for. And I had changed from a 35 millimeter camera to a view camera. Uh, teacher P. Perry uh, sort of taught me as well, and then I left my own afterwards. And so this was half to half, half um, natural. And um, I think they're very, very amusingly like that photograph of my family taken by Vogue. So, I want to talk about um, our Indian trip and how this all came about. And well, I want to say about this photograph, I mean, this is an, a kind of iconic photograph, not only for Tina, but I think for the history of photography, which was included in something called the Big Picture Show that That's John right. Sarkowski organized at, at MoMA in New York in 1982, was it? Yes, 83. So a year after this picture was taken. And it was really a, a complete change, you know, that photographs were now very, very large. And this photograph was printed very, very large. And these people that you have photographed are friends and family, and you've continued to photograph them over the years, many, many years now. But this was really an important photograph for you. Um, and really for, uh, for the way that photography changed, don't you think? Thank you, yes, yes, it Absolutely. was. There are, there are a group of us, um, but it's Basically, there was a movement, um, and I named Larry Sullivan and many others. Uh, and of course, we didn't know that the other was doing the same that had to do with photographing families in, in a different way. And I think it's fascinating to look back and say, uh, okay, I was actually part of them, not that, that was actually happening. And you wonder why that had to do with the invention of the materials. Kodak invented paper this big. Color was back, you know, was was becoming the fad of the moment and things like that. Right. And we could look at the next photograph because I think it's such a good example of the work that you began to be, make and that you began to be known, uh, really known for. So this was 1985, three years later, um, all taken, um, you know, by myself with the same view camera. And at my aunt's house, uh, I, I can talk about this photograph for a long time, but um, these are, the, you know, the ratio of, of, of successful pictures, of course, was very slim, but this was, this was what I was hoping for. Right. And I also want to just say that I think that you became a photographer and that I became a writer. We're both self-taught and that uh, I didn't grow up with books, 
you certainly grew up with art. You came from a family who collected art. And, um, but I don't think they produce many artists. You know, I think that you are a real anomaly in a way that you come out of a certain background and culture that was really known more for people who supported art, curated art, collected art, but didn't really produce artists. Do you think that's fair to say? Yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I think so too. I think that oh, we're both you know, anomalies in a way, you know, in that sense. Well, my grandfather was, uh, on my mother's side, was a, a uh, amateur photographer. I'd mm -hmm. like to think that he influenced me a lot. And my mother was a fashion model. Mm -hmm. So that's another influence. Then became an interior decorator. So all those loves are part of what I love in the photographs that I take. And so I knew your mother and she was a very beautiful woman, incredibly beautiful, um, you know, right into old age. And she created extraordinary interiors and you grew up with extraordinary interiors. And I think that sensibility is such an important part of your work. Um, how rooms look, how houses look, how people create spaces for themselves. And I think that really comes from your, a lot from your mother. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, so I the, do. The next photograph is really I iconic too, and, and Tina will talk about that. So uh, 19, um, in 95, I went on a trip to India with my friend Sheila, who traveled around the world. We went with the little company uh, that would start you off in a four-star hotel and then slowly break you down. We ended up in this tiny town, four hours of a rough, bumpy bus ride outside of the city of Udaipur. In this tiny town of Ganarao in a uh, 17th century castle uh, called uh, Ganarao Royal. And we stayed there and the woman on the left, Sushil, who was the, the mother of the family, the, the head of the family, the night we spent there, sat in a beach chair as we sat around her. This tour was only 15 people, it wasn't a tour, and told us the story of her life. I had never heard of Perda or what it was like to live in Perna, Perda. Um, she told us about married. She had to have this covered. She had a car with the shades in the car. She lived in a Zanana with closed shades. And would come up each night uh, to spend the night with her. And what a lonely, that was. As she went to tell me that story, I thought, I, I have to come back here and I have to see this woman again. And in 1990, I applied for a Guggenheim and asked Judith to come to India with me to go back to visit Sushi and try to do this. Family. And so Judith and I uh, started off in 1990, 1991, actually. And uh, can I just jump in here, yes. Tina, and we could go to the, you know, so this is Sushil and Sajan Singh, her husband and her daughter-in-law. This is Tina at that time when she decided to go into the women's quarters and have this conversation with Sushil that was so revelatory about her life. You can see Sushil is a very beautiful woman. She was raised in a Rajput noble family as was her husband and um but with more a uh, progressive father she was able to play sports she was connected to the maharaja family in udaipur she had a very privileged existence but she was basically educated um in british schools and as she put it she learned um to read cinderella before she ever learned anything about the Mahabharata or any of um, her own country's literature. She was, um, it was an arranged marriage. She was engaged when she was 13. She didn't, she was allowed to finish school and she very much wanted to go to college. She had two years of college and then it was time for her to get married to this Rajput noble who owned a hundred room crumbling castle, which is where Tina went to stay not crumbling so much then, but she um, had never seen her husband until the day of their marriage. And she said, after that, everything changed. She literally went into this system of such 
rigid, formal um, uh, family where the mother-in-law controlled everything. And I remember her telling us she never even was allowed for her mother-in-law to see her face for the first year. She lived in the women's quarter. She had to maintain Perta, this incredibly intelligent woman. So for Tina to sit there and hear this story of this amazing woman who would lay, go on to found a, a school for girls, would oversee water projects in her village. And um, the other thing is, is that in her first letter to Tina, she said, my husband has given me a farm. It's only a 10 minute walk from the castle and that's where you'll be staying and you'll have a full staff there to take care of you. And so when Tina and I arrived, we uh, stayed in this little farmhouse that was so important to Sue Shield. She said, Tina, I can never tell you what that farm means to me and what I, all of my hopes go into it. So it was, the beginning of a remarkable almost two month journey to India. When I think our friendship was really tested, <laughs> deepened the kinds of things we had to do and face. I don't think either one of us were really prepared for um, what was ahead, but let's look at the next um, photograph. Uh, this is the little farmhouse where we stayed. And you can see Tina with her four by five. And believe me, uh, using a four by five in India that way. I kind of don't know how you did it when I think about thank it. You, thank, you for, thank you for remembering that. I knew so little uh, technically after I left Sun Valley that I didn't even know there was such a thing as a changing bag. So I would have to wait till it was dark at night to go under my bed to change the film so I would have complete darkness. But, uh, there, there are a lot of sort of funny things, but I think it was worth it in the long run and we had we had help a lot of help young that were wonderful that were our friend became our friends that helped so if us we can have the next picture you'll see our 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 helpers um here we are the dude in the middle with the sunglasses uh that's that's my one of them has on my <laughs> i mean these people were so remarkable and the first sight when we arrived at the farmhouse, uh, Sushil wasn't there to greet us. She was having, her daughter was having a great crisis, but she had arranged for, for us to have dinner. She had brought her niece to cook for us and we could get settled in. And these two young men, when we sat down at the table, it was so formal. One stood behind Tina, one stood behind me. And if we would reach for a dish, they would jump up and, and, and move the dish. And at one point, Tina turned around and said, guys, uh, you know, you don't have to do that. We're just fine. We can pass the plates ourselves. We can do that. And I think for these young men, they had never been around Western women like us who were willing to just talk to them and um, have fun with them. And we ended up going on many excursions with all of the people who were helping us. We would go to temples. We had a a driver who would come in a Jeep and pick us up and take us to on outings to local temples or to remarkable sites. So we really came to like these people who took care of us, who were just so terrific. So that's another picture. Yeah. The point was to to do a story, but uh, what I didn't realize and wasn't prepared for was extraordinary formality and reserve. And I was used to telling people what to do, thinking I could move them around like I did with my friends at home. And the one memory I have, I don't know if you remember this, Judith, um, was the first time I photographed Sushil with her son and if he could sit on the arm of his mother's chair. And yeah. he said, oh, please, do you mind if I sit behind her? And when I finished photographing, I went up to him and I said, him at you will never sit on the arm of your mother's chair, will you? And I've forgotten that same day, he has to greet, he, he greeted his mother by kissing her feet every morning. Yes. And the, the, oh. the side of that is so, it was almost like, okay, did I really imagine? Uh, it, it, it's fast, the, the first time that I could hardly believe seeing. Um, so there were things like that that were just extraordinary, but 
almost impossible to cap capture um, because I, we had to be so careful of their uh, and respectful of their customs. Um, so, you know, some photographs are, are quite formal and stiff and some aren't. Right. Let's go to the next. Um, this picture. one here. So in this little town of Ganarao, which was quite tiny, really, it's a very small village, but with this huge old castle, a hundred rooms maybe. And when Tina first went there, um, there were maybe eight rooms that had electricity and electricity had only come to the village maybe 10 years before. And yet um, Lindblad Tours thought Castle Ganarao would be a, a real experience and it, and it it certainly was. By the time we got there, it really wasn't much changed. The electricity right. would go on and off. Um, and then we would walk through the village and people would really regard us as though it was, it was really unusual to see two white women. And we have to say that Sajan Singh and Sashil, Sushil, um, they were struggling that when Indira Gandhi abolished the privy purse for the upper class ruling Rajput uh, nobles, they really lost their income. And the only way many of them could see to continue was to turn their properties into hotels. But of course, you know, they needed so much work. So to be in this little village together for that long we also ended up meeting Sushil's relatives and traveling to other villages and staying in other situations of castles that have been taken over by monkeys where there was maybe, you know, a half a dozen rooms that were inhabited. Um, so that was photographing an extended family in some sense, the way that Tina has been photographing extended family and um, friends for so many years. Judith, can I just object also that we go there uh, for the purpose of maybe one making a book and have this for a long time. Do you want to sort of polish on that, Judith, that, that we're trying to sort of uh, not, not find a plot, but um, you know, sort of have an idea of what we might do along the way. We always hoped to make a book. I was keeping notebooks the whole time we were in India and Tina was making photographs, a lot of photographs. I was also carrying a 35 millimeter and photographing her. And we thought when we came back, the whole idea was that we would make the India book with her photographs and my writing. It proved to be much more difficult at that time. Um, I did write, uh, uh, try to write a manuscript. We, we, we talked to different, uh, uh, people about it and they would say, well, what is this book? Is it a travel book? Is it a book about friendship? Is it a book about India? Is it a book about photography? Is it a memoir? What is this book? And at that time in 1991, 92, the borders between genres were very stiff and it was also very expensive to make a book with color photographs in it. Now, all these years later, so we essentially backed away and thought, well, there must be a way to do this, but we went on with our lives. I wrote novels and other books and Tina, of course, continued to make wonderful photographs. But now after all these years, we feel that the time has come that we can make this book. And in part because the times have changed because people are interested in books now that are not rigidly confined to one genre. There's a lot of mushing of borders of genres that makes it very interesting and makes it possible to make a very different kind of book. And so this talk tonight, this conversation that we're having, I think we're excited about it because in a way it's the beginning of saying, we are now ready to make the India book and to go back into those experiences 30 years later. I don't think we have to return to India to do that. I The notes that I have, the letters from Sushil, the little notes she used to write to us and send by messenger from the castle to the farmhouse, the documentation, the richness of that experience is, is just fully there. So we're really excited about the idea of making this book out of this 
experience that was really such a high point of our friendship. Um, let's photograph Caitlin too, please. Um, well said, Judith. Uh, I'm glad you're the writer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're the artist. <laughs> Read my writing first. I always give them <laughs> anything that I write first, including MacArthur Park because I trust her so much, because she knows me so well, because she'll always tell me the truth, because she has a great literary sensibility, because she's a real reader, and because she's just my first reader. So anyway, here we are. Or Sheil again. Um, see, is, is um, they, uh, to, to take a self-portrait, you know, to some fantastic gadgets, I'd like it uh, be known that uh, we're taking our own photograph or I'm, I pulled the trigger myself. I love the cord snaking out. Uh, yeah. And, and I had the Punjabis I had made on my first trip. So uh, we still had uh, these in Punjabis to wear uh, from the 1980 trip, trip. Right. So we wore those from time to time. And this day we asked Sushil if she would take us into the women's quarters. Um, Zanana. The Zanana, which had been closed up for many years and also was just crumbling. And this was where she lived her life as a young married woman confined to the women's quarters. There were rooms when there was activity in the courtyard where they could go up and look through lattice windows, but you couldn't be seen even if you were in Purda you had to be behind this lattice window. And the way that she lived her life was so extraordinary. And I can understand why the farm was so important to her. It gave her such pride to have her own property. Um, so even when we would take a trip, she took us to the school that she had started for schools. She was still such a revered figure because they were the major landholders had been um, for years. Sajan Singh's family, that she still had to wear purda in the village, um, even though many people had long given that up. But because she was the figure that she was, she had to show respect, or they had to show respect. She had to be, her face had to be covered. So anything to add to that, Tina, or should we go to the next one? Well, Let's go to the next picture. Um, I mean, we have so many wonderful stories to tell. Uh, we can yeah. go on and on. Um, this is Sushil's uh, son, Himmet. Who would reach down every morning when he greeted his mother. I don't remember him kissing her feet, but I do remember he had to touch the hem. Of it was it's weird. That's all I can say. It's, it's, it's so hard to believe. So I asked my sons to do that for me when I came home every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I've always loved this picture of Tina. I, I, I just think it's one of the most wonderful pictures that you took while we were in India. And you, you took some really great portraits. Anyway, we can go on to the next one. Yes, thank you. This is Sushil's husband, Sajan Singh. And he had agreed to put on his sort of royal clothes. You well, can this, this was what he wore when he was married. That's right. Without because. Behind him is a picture of him in that outfit, black and white from his wedding day. Um, hey, may I just add this, Judith? Uh, this came from an influence of Mark Klett, Joanne Verberg, and Ellen Manchester's project that I was uh, surrounded by when I lived in Sun Valley. And their project was to go back to the photographer uh, and O'Sullivan the site in and go to the same That was the re-photographic survey yeah. that they did, right. They would go to the same spot and photograph the same thing many years later. So, so I asked Sajan Singh to stand in the same place that he stood at his wedding, in the photograph of his next to the place wearing the same map. I photographed him and uh, Sheil um, in those places. And the one thing Sushil said was that they, she essentially met a stranger on the day of her marriage. It was the first time she had met him after being engaged for seven years. 
And even though she said we're very different, I mean, she had to obey everything that he said. You are obliged. Um, so you feel very much a secondary citizen, which in so many ways isn't different from what a lot of women in America experience. This is a very extreme example where his word was law, his family controlled everything. And she said, after many years, however, um, we have managed to find, you know, what does she always say that we have managed to, um, um, our marriage has survived on a strong foundation of mutual affection. And one could feel that with them. They were both very handsome people, but one could also feel they were, they were struggling very hard to figure out how to, how to live um, in this new world where everything was changing. And I think for us, for Tina, especially the world was also changing. Maybe young men don't stand up anymore or young mm -hmm. people when an adult comes into a room. Um, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that you know loosens the respect between young people and adults. But those rituals I felt you, you could really connect to. I could connect to that extreme form of patriarchy. I think that we're to almost the end of our talk. See the last picture, um, there are two here, um, yeah. if you don't mind, Judith. Um, so th this photograph here is sort of uh, what I dreamt of. This is the kind of picture I wanted to take. Um, the whole, the whole kind of uh, composition, what was happening, the, the very strange situation that it looks or appears to be. Do you talk about the night that this was, uh, we spent the night at the castle. We have dinner and after dinner, um, the, the servants gathered together mattresses for all the women to sleep on the floor, us included at this house in the country. Um, very intimate, I, you know, something that I sort of would have dreamt of happening because it was so personal and really, uh, I felt as if we were part of the family. So this, this is the servant carrying the mattress and the lady of the house with the strange, strange in the background. And we met three generations. We met her mother and her daughter and sat in this other crumbling castle in a another village and had dinner with the electricity going on and off, then slept in with all the women on mattresses on the floor. And um, it was an extraordinary experience. Um, Can we see the, the next picture, Kate? Sorry, Judith. The yeah. Same night. I mean, I think this is so strange with the fluorescent light on top of that large photograph. That's a photograph. And it was constantly, the light was constantly flickering. And this old woman, who I think was 90 something, had been married to the aide de camp of the Maharaja of Jaipur. Oh, and his know. nickname was Bunny. And I okay. think Bunny and the Maharaja had had just a lot of fun together. There were photographs we came across later of them in England and with, you know, very beautiful women, I think that um, we went to their house in Jaipur. And that was also just an amazing experience. So altogether, you know, this, um, this time that, that Tina and I had, it was, it was totally unforgettable and just so rich. And I'm so hoping that, you know, we can make a book out of it that we'll both be really happy with. I think there's one more picture of us in India on one of our outings uh, against a, a landscape. I remember we'd gone to see temples and cobras, <laughs> you know. Um, I think we're coming to the end of the trip here, but, um, and we're certainly coming to the end of the slideshow and we would be so happy to answer any questions or Thank you, talk about anything uh, if anyone, uh, has any questions, comments? Um, thanks, Judith. That was, thank you. Thank you, Tina. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, how do you that? So thank you. I, you know, th that was a wonderful conversation. Great to see all those photos. 
um, I'm reading through the comments here to see if anybody has any questions. And please, if you do have questions, drop them in the chat. Um, I'm just wondering if the both of you can talk about what's the next step in the in the process towards making this, you know, bringing this project to fruition. Well, a I lot think of work to talk about Judith. that. <laughs> Judith has all the work to do. I am going back into my journals and to, into the letters that Sushil and Tina exchanged, into all of the notes that we received, and into the manuscript that I originally wrote, which was long, and to pull that into a much tighter story of, of that trip and our experience. So that's the next step is to really get the story down and then to look at the photographs and the um, ephemera and um, the sort of uh, images that we would like to use in the book. And there are a lot of them. There are, Tina took many, many photographs. And we I did many photographs of, with the 35 millimeter. And the interesting thing is now we were passing the camera back and forth so we kind of don't know sometimes when we look at some of the pictures, did you take that or did I take that? And just the 35 millimeter. Um, but there was a lot of sharing going on on that level, yeah. I see it in here that I think was for Judith. Uh, oh, darn, I lost it. Is it possible briefly about a little sense in writing a literary picture tape could you hear, did you hear me? Judith, did you hear that? Yeah, I so I can, I can restate it for you, Tina. So the question from Keith is, is it possible to talk briefly about a visual sense in writing and a literary sense in picture making? Wow, that's a complex question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I always think I'm making strong pictures with words and that I want, I don't know if this is what you mean, Tina. Uh, um, but I don't know quite yet how the pictures are going to fit with the words. And I think that's going to be a very exciting moment to get to that point and figure out how, how will that work? I mean, is that kind of what you meant? The, the I didn't ask the question. Else yeah, the question was from, from, uh, from Keith, Keith Davis, actually. And, oh, um, oh, Keith. and I think it was in, in a broader sense, you know, talking about a uh, visual sense when you're approaching writing, not necessarily the, just this book, but writing in general, and uh, a literary sense when approaching uh, picture making or a narrative in picture making. Mm. I don't make many pictures, so uh, I don't quite know how to answer that question, but I can certainly say, Keith, that um, uh, it is very important for me to make a very strong picture of the world that I'm creating in a book. And that I've used photographs in the past, for instance, in my novel, Red Water. I really relied on um, a lot of photographs from the 19th century at the Huntington Library, particularly of native people to give me a stronger sense. So there has been a back and forth in my work between the visual and the literary. I guess that's one way of saying it. May I ask, Judith, um, I, I remember saying that, that there was a scene in your MacArthur Park, Park, well, probably in all your books, and I don't know if people have uh, the same sensation, but when I'm reading, I, ha I have a sense in my brain. I'm picturing what I'm reading. I don't know if that's, that's what Keith means by literary sense or a picture or, or visual sense, but um, mm -hmm. that's, that's something that I think is um, interesting to think about. Um, what else here? I so, think one of the other things that we wanted to say, Tina and I, is that, I mean, since the theme is in, uninterrupted, our friendship has really been uninterrupted and grown stronger and stronger over the years. But a lot of that has been through letters in the beginning. We didn't always see each other, you know, uh, for a year or two, it might, it might pass. Um, and maybe that was even more as we grew older, we wouldn't see each other so often, but we have all of each other's letters and we wrote many, many letters to each other. And Tina kept all my letters and I kept all hers. And it's a record that I haven't even gone back and looked at yet, but I know that it's 
very, very rich, that it's a very rich story of a friendship of two women who are evolving, whose art is evolving, whose work is evolving. Now we do email, but we also rely a lot on phone calls. We like, and, and I just feel like I, uh, I talk to Tina about things that are so important to me. We constantly have this conversation going on that I miss the written letter very much. And Jolene and MacArthur Park goes on and on about how tragic it is that we will not have a record of this time, an intellectual record of what people are thinking and feeling. We won't have collections of letters in the future. I don't see it. It's and a crime. That's a great loss to me. Here's a question, but uh, I wonder if an aspect of the book that addresses the notion of photographic imperialism, if there's thing of a Western photographer shooting locals or locales in India, or is it somehow because so many of the subjects from the higher caste? Mm. I wish I could die. Are you, anyway, what do you mean by anyway, that? I'm, I lost you a little bit there, Tina. Um, um, do you want to read that again? Mm. Yeah. I have a feeling I know what, I wonder if there's an aspect of the book that addresses the notion of photographic imperialism, if there's such a thing, of a Western photographer in India, or is it different somehow because subjects are from the higher? I think what you're saying is um, uh, that, that it, it's difficult to photograph in a foreign place. Mm -hmm. But because the people I photographed are from the higher caste, which might be similar to my own, do I, do I relate to it? Um, is it familiar to me? I think is so. Is that, that what David Francis means? Um, I think so, yeah. And the answer to that is this higher caste is completely foreign to anything I've ever experienced. The formality is so extreme. Right. It relate to uh, someone from from uh, the upper class um, in England, but to have to to kiss your mother's feet every morning, and never be able to sit your mother's chair is something that I, luckily I I have experienced. Well, I think it relates to. I feel that the formality with the way you were raised. With oh yeah, I do. I do too. each other, you know. Um, anyway, does. We should let someone else yes. have a question. Sure. I think this is a, a good question, actually, that might um, be a nice one to end on. But the question was, any advice on how long-term, um, long-distance friends best deal with any big struggles with each other along the way? Well, so bringing it back to female friendship and, and over a long period of time, um, you know, how do you stay connected in long distance and how you deal with, with big struggles? Um, um, from, from a distance or over the long term. Mm -hmm. Being there, I think. Don't you, Judith? Yeah, I think it's just showing up and, yeah. um, and Even being there. On and the telephone. In MacArthur Park, Jolene is a very self-involved, very brittle, very difficult woman. And one of the things, and Verna is actually a very much kinder, much more giving woman. And one of the things I realized is we all have to have that capacity for, for forgiveness and for understanding. And um, every friendship usually runs into that kind of, some kind of pain, some kind of misunderstanding. And I thought that in MacArthur Park, I was able to resolve that in that they were able to <laughs> offer each other love and support in the end. And I think that that's all that counts is that of course you're gonna have difficulties. Of course you're gonna feel upset. Um, Tina and I have felt that with each other. I'm probably more difficult than she is and she always forgives me. She's always there for me, you know? So that's the grace that we all hope to be moving toward to be that kind of person that you can actually not just be a good friend but sort of be a forgiving friend, I guess. Okay. Would you agree, Tina? But uh, uh, you want to have a 
a fist <laughs> We could do that. <laughs> Just see Kelly out there. To know if uh, we is of how we were visually going to lay out this book, and my answer to that is, well, Kelly, if you have any ideas, please <laughs> let us know. <laughs> All you smart people out there, um, it's going to be an exciting project to work on, um, and I'm so happy that after 30 years and 40 years of friendship that this will be really our first collaboration. collaboration. Am I right about that? I mean, to together. create an object, to create something together in that way. I think it's, I think it's the first, that kind of collaboration. So thank, thank you for introducing me to you, Ross, um, uh, Bill and Caitlin. Thank you for your patience with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, a yes, technical thank you. here. <laughs> and thanks everybody for coming tonight. Yes. yes. So I'll I'll just say, you know, to close here, um, you can tell by the comments and the people chiming here in the chat that everyone's really excited to see what happens with the with the book <laughs> and the collaboration. Um, and I think is was a beautiful, wonderful conversation, okay. a great slideshow and discussion. And I want to thank you, of course, for for being part of the series. Um, I hope those out there um, listening and viewing here um, will also pick up MacArthur Park, go check out some uh, um, photography and keep your eyes peeled for what comes of this collaboration in this book, because I think we'll all uh, want to see it as soon as it materializes. And of course, as always, you can follow along at what's going on with UCross at UCross.org. Um, and we hope you join us on the next in Uninterrupted as it becomes available. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Judith. Thanks. Have a wonderful night. All right. So much. Bye. Bye.